This is the world, inhabited not by millions, but by more than two billion human beings. This is America, stretching 3,200 miles from one vast ocean to another, and 2,100 miles from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico. In this great expanse live 150 million people for whom this land must provide food and all the other necessities of life. Yes, 150 million people who must be supplied with food every day, 365 days a year. In theory, each of us requires about three acres of fertile soil to sustain life. But taken literally, Chicago alone would cover 10 million acres. So it is not practical for each to provide his own acres, nor is he obliged to do so. For some choose to raise the wheat, while others manage and operate transportation. Some choose to develop the dairy herds, while others choose to manufacture goods. Some choose to raise the fruits and vegetables, Others process these foods. Each contributes to the comfort and well-being of the other. And while each succeeds on individual merit and may be unaware of doing anything for anyone but himself, our economic system is based on the contribution of the individual to the welfare of all. This system grew and progressed with the railroads, which enabled us to ship goods to far-flung markets. And it grew because in our system, the man with an idea could make himself heard. When we can't go over mountains, we go through them. Yes, the American was ever the man who didn't know that it couldn't be done, so he promptly did it. Our progress was the result of enterprising thought, and many industries were built and those which were founded on sound business principles and good management endured and prospered over the years. But we're getting ahead of our story. Let's go now to the little church on Austin Avenue. There's an important meeting here today. Mrs. Harwood is on the program, and she has a surprising story to tell. That's Mrs. Thompson, the chairman of the group. When she's appointed her committees and reported on the current activities, She'll turn the meeting over to Mrs. Harwood. Mrs. Harwood scarcely needs an introduction. She's among friends and neighbors who know her and her teenage daughter and 12-year-old son quite well. But let's listen now. When the subjects for our yearly papers were distributed last spring and I drew the dairy industry, I hardly knew where to begin. And then while taking milk from my refrigerator one day, I suddenly realized that the dairy industry is one to which we are really close. The quart of milk I held in my hand was not many hours from the farm and had been processed not ten blocks away. So I went down to the Medigold plant to visit Mr. Briggs, the manager. He was very helpful. Yes, Mr. Briggs showed Mrs. Harwood and her son the operation of a milk plant including the testing of the milk on the receiving platform and all phases of how milk is carefully processed and safeguarded every step of the way through the dairy to the customer's doorstep. Upon their return to the office, Mr. Briggs showed Mrs. Harwood a milk flow chart, which is a graphic description of how all milk produced reaches the public. Let's have Mr. Briggs tell the story. A certain percent of milk flows into the dairy where it is processed and delivered within a few hours. This involves a large number of trained personnel and many types of service. You remember, Mrs. Harwood, out in the plant you saw the receiving platform where milk is first tested for purity and richness. If it meets certain definite standards, it's poured into a spotlessly clean stainless steel receiving vat. For those who prefer the uniform creaminess of homogenized milk, a certain quantity went into the homogenizer. You saw how milk is thoroughly pasteurized with up-to-the-minute equipment to ensure that every bottle of milk bearing the metal gold seal is perfectly pure and wholesome. 
you are shown control indicators that ensure absolute precision in time and temperature for the protection of the milk you drink in your home. And you observed how bottles are filled and capped without the sterilized bottle being touched by hand. A thoroughly streamlined operation, which is a far cry from the old days when the housewife ran out with a pan when the milk cart came along and raw milk was ladled from a common container. You saw how the capper stamps out special aluminum foil caps, which are perfect protection for the bottle of milk you receive in your hall. And I hope you found some of the material you need for your paper in the things you saw today. Indeed I have. And I was surprised, Mr. Briggs, at the amount of work and care it takes. Well, the service we render is the reason for our being. It's not just something added, it's our work. Our routine is one of constant, careful service. But the things you saw are only a part of the whole picture. Now another quantity of whole milk and cream flows from the farm to the ice cream plants where it's tested, flavored, frozen, packaged, and then delivered to your grocery or drugstore. Oh, I see. And some of the milk is separated on the farm and cream sent to our butter plants, where it's weighed, tested, pasteurized, cooled, and churned into butter. Then it's hardened, cut, wrapped, and delivered to homes and groceries. Well, there's a lot of work, isn't there, in getting dairy products to our homes? And there is more work than is indicated on this chart. Actually, our service begins right on the farm. Our field men help the farmer with his problems of developing fine herds and producing pure, wholesome milk. Sanitation on the farm is very important, and our field men help and advise the farmer in this, too. Yes, I particularly notice that everything here in the plant is very clean. It has to be. That's our responsibility to you and to all our customers. The equipment you saw today is washed, rinsed, scalded, and sterilized after every using. And cleanliness requires constant work and exacting care all day long. I suppose all your plants do much the same work as I saw today? The milk plants, yes. But milk accounts for about 26% of company business. Only 26%? We have a variety of products, each of which is processed differently. We're a food company and many different company products are sold through grocery stores. We have plants all over the country, Mrs. Harwood. I wish you could see some of them. Well, perhaps we can. We're planning a trip this summer, and some of the plants may be right on our way. Well, say, Mrs. Harwood, you shop in Chicago quite often, don't you? Well, yes, I do. Next time you're there, stop and see our president, Mr. Haskell. He can give you a list of the towns where our plants are located. Oh, I doubt if the president of a big company would want to bother with my problems. He'll be glad to help you. And if there's anything further I can do, let me know. Goodbye, Mrs. Harwood, and come in when you get back from your trip. There are a lot of these plants I haven't seen myself, and I'd like to hear about them. Well, goodbye, Mr. Briggs. Thank you so much for all your help, and I will give you a full report when we return. And Mrs. Harwood accepts Mr. Briggs' suggestion that on their next trip to Chicago, she visit Mr. Haskell, president of Beatrice Foods Company, who can assist her in securing the information she wants for her paper. Mr. Haskell will see our visitors right away. In their walk to his office, they pass murals on the walls, which tell the story of Beatrice Foods Company and its many plants, and show the organization at work. Mrs. Harwood and her two children, Mr. Haskell. How do you do, How do you Mrs. Do, Mr. Harwood? Haskell? My daughter, Helen Ann. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Haskell? And my son, Art. Well, How are you, young fellow? Won't you be seated? Thank you. Well, what can I do for you, Miss Harwood? First of all, I should tell you that I'm preparing a paper on the economics of food. And I've chosen dairy products as my subject. That's splendid. Now the children and I are planning to take a tour of some of the historical spots of the United States this summer. And I thought of sort of working the two in together by stopping along the way and visiting some of the Meadow Gold plants. But I'm afraid I'm taking up your time with something that must seem trivial to you, Mr. Haskell. Not at all, Miss Harwood. I have spent most of my life in the dairy industry and to me every phase of the business is important. Now I'd like to ask a favor of you, Miss Harwood. When you come back, stop in and see me again. Mr. Haskell gave us a list of the various plants around the United States. 
and I noticed at a glance that we'd have the opportunity of visiting many of them, as they were right on our itinerary. And as we left Mr. Haskell, Art made it clear that he was quite interested in the plants too, particularly the ice cream plants. While you're here, Mrs. Harwood, why not begin by going through our medical butter plant and see our fine laboratories and experimental kitchens all in the same plant? Oh, that would make a fine start for my paper. Do they have any ice cream plants? They certainly do, young fellow. Do they give away samples? Oh, I really? You choose your own flavors. Goodbye, Miss Harwood. Goodbye, Mr. Thanks Haskell. for coming in. Thank you for being so gracious. And Mrs. Harwood is glad of the opportunity to see more of Meadow Gold right in Chicago. Here we find her in the butter plant. This is one of the finest butter plants in the United States. It is one of many meadow gold plants which help supply the American people with butter. In this sparkling white tiled room, giant churns with a combined output of 40,000 pounds daily are in operation. And Mrs. Harwood learns that good butter begins in the receiving room where cream from the farms is graded. Cream which meets all tests is pasteurized thoroughly, cooled to churning temperature, and then pumped into the churns by means of stainless steel pumps. These huge churns are filled half full of rich, high-grade cream, and then revolve at steady speed for 30 minutes. Let's have a look at that churn. No dashers here. The revolving motion does it all. And here a chemist from the control laboratory takes a sample of the freshly churned butter to test for compliance, not only with government standards, but with Beatrice Foods Company's own high standards for meadow gold butter. A sample from each churning is tested in the control laboratory. When the butter gathers, the buttermilk is drained off and is later sold to commercial houses for farm feed. Butter is washed with water to remove any residue of buttermilk. And then the butter is deftly removed with smooth wooden paddles. These specially designed baskets are lined with fine white parchment paper. And as the blocks of butter are turned onto the truck, each retains its protective covering of parchment. Each step is completely sanitary and efficient. And the fresh golden butter is ready for the print room. In the butter print room, the Harwoods see how the butter is cut, quartered, and packaged. Meadow Gold butter was first to be cottoned by the pound and first to be divided in quarter pounds. This intricate packaging machine does all the work. It wraps the butter in special aluminum foil to preserve its freshness and good flavor. And now it's automatically put into cartons at the rate of 110 quarter pounds per minute. It is checked for exact weight and packed by neat, meticulous workers whose dexterity is a pleasure to watch. And Mrs. Harwood learns that butter, which is delivered both to homes and groceries, constitutes 25% of company business. In another part of this large plant, the Harwoods were shown the research laboratory. Research is a very important phase of any food product company which is constantly striving to serve the public better and doing their part in providing food for 150 million people. These food technicians, who are all graduate chemists, are using their knowledge and experience to improve the Beatrice products of today and find new uses for them in the home. It is here that new products are developed which will help the housewife in her daily problem of feeding her family. Their work is very important, as the progress of any institution depends upon its ability to make life more pleasant and profitable for the American people. Upon leaving the research laboratory, the Harwoods were shown the Bakery Experimental Laboratory. In this department, products are developed which enable bakers to improve the quality of their baked goods. For as every housewife knows, 
dairy products are an important factor in the preparation of many breads, cakes, cookies, and pastries. The products offered the bakery trade must first be thoroughly tried, tested, and proved in actual bakings. And here we find a home economist who is busy developing new dishes to assist the housewife in the daily preparation of over 1,000 meals a year. The final tested recipes which result are then made available to the never-ending list of Meadow Gold customers. Housewives have found this a most valuable service. One of the most important laboratories in the entire Beatrice organization is called the Control Laboratory. This is the laboratory which is constantly on guard, checking the products of all Beatrice plants. As in the other laboratories, these men and women are graduates in bacteriology as well as in food classifications. Their work is highly important and they render an invaluable service to every meadow gold plant and to the public. We must not forget the pilot plant. This duplicates Beatrice plant equipment in miniature. Every piece of equipment necessary for the production of Beatrice products is duplicated here. Here constant effort is made to discover more economical ways to process the products of Beatrice and the resulting information is passed on to each plant so that they too may have the benefit of the most efficient and economical production methods. Mrs. Harwood has received here some idea of the tremendous amount of time and labor necessary to help the entire organization in the most efficient methods of serving the American people. Well, school is out and the Harwoods are on their way. We, of course, are most concerned with the phase of this vacation tour which concerns Mrs. Harwood's paper on the dairy industry. But let's join them in appreciating some of the lovely scenery along the way. This is the Black Hawk Monument seen from across the river. It towers 80 feet above the surrounding woodlands. This is one of Laredo Taft's famous works. Let's catch up with the Harwoods as they're about to visit the Chox plant. Chox, as you know, is one of Meadow Gold's most popular food products. Here they learn how Chox is made from fresh, whole milk and other top quality ingredients. Through the portholes, they can look into the large stainless steel chamber into which liquid hot chocolate is sprayed under great pressure. The heat of this chamber dehydrates the hot chocolate and the resulting solids, or chocks, is fed through stainless steel pipes to the packaging room below. In the packaging room, each attractive chocks box is filled automatically to an accurate and uniform weight. This is a busy place as the increasing demand for chocks proves the American housewife is appreciative of the extra quality and good flavor of hot chocolate made instantly with chocks. And this filling machine does everything but think. It fills small envelopes exactly, seals them perfectly, and folds them neatly. They're packed ready for easy selection from the grocer's counter. And Mrs. Harwood stops to thank the manager of the chocks plant for interesting material for her paper. Chalks is a real time saver for me, and I was very much interested in seeing it made, Mr. White. Well, the demand for chalks is increasing all the time. Along with other manufactured dairy products, such as cheese and dried milk, it accounts for about 7% of company mm -hmm. business. Well, they told me in Chicago that many years of research went into making and perfecting chalks. Yes, and our years of research were well spent, Mrs. Harwood. You can rely on chalks just as you can rely on meadow gold milk and butter. And thanks to those years of research, the chances of chalks being equaled or surpassed are very, very small. 
Well, we certainly like chalks at our house. We drink it for breakfast. The children love it after school, and they always call for it when they have their friends over. I've recommended it to many of my friends, and they like it just as much as we do. There's just one thing better than a satisfied customer, Mrs. Harwood, and that's an enthusiastic customer. And in your church paper now, don't forget to put down some of those nice things you've said about chalks. Well, I certainly won't forget. All right. Goodbye, Mr. White. I'm very grateful for your help. Goodbye, Mrs. Harwood. Glad to be of help anytime. <laughs> Thank you. And once again, we're on the highways. And here we find the Harwoods getting a thrill out of crossing the Mississippi. This great father of waters courses through valleys where a bountiful portion of the nation's food supply is produced. And not only food, but flowers. And this wild phlox, which attracted the Harwoods, seems also to have attracted bumblebees. And at one of the beautiful, well-kept farms along the way, the Harwoods stop for a brief visit with the wife of a dairy farmer. Mrs. Harwood is invited into the Owens' living room, where Mrs. Owens is quite willing to supply the viewpoint of a dairy farmer's wife. The dairy farmer's life is one of long hours and hard work. No holidays, but he is well paid for his efforts. And they have every convenience on the farm that you have in the city. Lights, gas, refrigeration, radio, and telephone. The farmer today is a real businessman. And in this little office off the kitchen, Mr. Owens and the dairy field man are discussing some current problem. Mr. Owens can put a finger on the facts he needs. He keeps his accounts and records on his herd in a book furnished for this purpose by his Meadow Gold Dairy Plant. He knows where he stands and is constantly improving his herd and his methods. And while Mother chats in the living room, Art gets acquainted with two prize calves. Farmer Owens has a very fine herd of Holstein cows. They produce more milk, but it is not as rich as that of other breeds, such as the Guernsey. As the Harwoods travel on their way, they see many herds of Guernseys, for many consider the Guernsey the queen of the dairy industry. Not only does the Guernsey produce a satisfactory quantity of milk, but its richness is exceeded only by one breed, and that is the Jersey. And there's a herd of black Angus. They are both beef and dairy cows, and are seen in growing numbers on American farms. And here's a herd of brown Swiss in charge of Shep. Shep was instructed to bring the herd up where you could get a good look at it, and evidently he understood your every word. Shep has a part in the tremendous task of supplying food for America. Good work, Shep. And as the Harwoods travel farther on, they see many wonderful sights, for there is probably no land with such variety of beautiful scenery. On their trip through the Rockies, the Harwoods meet meadow gold trucks, bringing fine meadow gold products from central plants to the smaller cities and towns. This service is very extensive and permits communities which could not afford the fine equipment and help of the large plant to share in the benefits of meadow gold products. This system of rapid transportation makes meadow gold products available everywhere. In the next Meadow Gold town, the Harwoods visit a refrigerated warehouse, and Mrs. Harwood gets some important facts for her paper. I'm not very clear as to how your plant fits into my paper on the food industry, Mr. Gordon. Well, if our service were to stop suddenly, Housewives would soon notice the absence of many desirable foods from the grocery stores. We're the great community refrigerator, Mrs. Harwood, just like the one in your home. We keep perishable foods at the proper temperatures and distribute them when they're needed. Well, I suppose then that's why some foods never go out of season. Yes, the harvesting season on fruits and vegetables covers but one or two months of the year. But during that time, 
Large quantities are picked, wrapped, and packed for use throughout the rest of the year. But in order to preserve their soundness and quality, they must be stored at keeping temperature, ready for use. Well, I suppose I hadn't really thought much about how food is stored and distributed. Most people don't think about it. But while we've had many spectacular inventions in our time, it's doubtful if any of these has added as much to your comfort and convenience as modern refrigeration, such as we have here. I hadn't realized what an important thing it is, Mr. Gordon. I'd like to see the plant if it's convenient. Why, of course it's convenient, Mrs. Harwood. And the Harwoods are provided with heavy coats before they go into the refrigerated rooms. Here they see cold, firm apples each in its own tissue wrapping and looking good enough to eat. Among the many foods Mrs. Harwood saw were boxes of young fryers kept in rooms 20 degrees below zero. Even with their heavy caps and sheep-lined jackets, the workers stay no longer than two hours at a stretch in these frigid temperatures. Well, Mrs. Harwood, do you see now that the refrigerated warehouse is pretty essential in supplying the American housewife with Fresh foods at all times of the year? I certainly do, Mr. Gordon. I'm going to give the refrigerated warehouse a very prominent place in my paper on food. Why, it's far more important than I'd realized. Yes, it's one of the very important phases of our business. In fact, our specialty foods and services, in which storage is included, account for 14% of our business. And poultry and eggs account for another 8% of company business. Well, that's 22% in all. Beatrice Foods Company must have a great many refrigerated warehouses. Yes, and if it weren't for refrigerated warehouses, such as you saw today, there'd be a great waste in crops and harvest. And we not only use our warehouses for metal gold products, but to accommodate other distributors as well. Well, I certainly have a much clearer picture of how perishable foods are stored, and why we can enjoy our favorite foods the year round. And thank you, Mr. Gordon, for taking the time to show some of these things to me. It was a pleasure to have you here, Mrs. Harwood. A cold place like this doesn't attract many visitors. There's always a warm welcome here for you. Don't forget that. Oh, well, thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Gordon. Goodbye, Mrs. Harwood. And the Harwoods are on their way again. And here along the route, they're held by the peaceful beauty of a river winding through the green countryside. And in a little town in Ohio, in the center of a fine vegetable growing community, we find the Lachoy plant, which is a subsidiary of Beatrice Foods Company. This plant produces grocery specialties as well as Vegemato, one of the most popular of vegetable juice combinations. Here we see workers picking the red ripe tomatoes in the field and trucks picking up the baskets as fast as they are filled. These are taken to the Lachoy plant, where they are graded by federal inspectors, and then are placed in the tomato park, ready to receive their first bath in the large flume which carries them into the plant. The flume has a water current of about 18 miles an hour, and the tomatoes travel through it into the plant, where they are picked up by a conveyor and given a stinging needle point shower. By this time, they appear to be thoroughly cleansed, but for good measure, they are taken through a very high pressure shower bath and they come out sparkling clean. Next, they are sorted, then crushed. The fresh juice of the other vegetables, plus a dash of real lemon juice is added and the vitamin rich, healthful juice is canned and delivered to the stores. Vegemato is a very popular item from the Lachoy plant. Well, the Harwoods have seen many interesting meadow gold plants, but Art's been waiting for one in particular. Now, of course, we don't mean to infer that on this long trip, Art hasn't had his chance to enjoy meadow gold ice cream. It's been a refreshing treat all along the way. But an ice cream plant will be the next stop. Hear that, Art? And in this plant, the Harwoods can see one of their favorite foods in the making. Early in the process, ice cream is pasteurized and homogenized. Only the finest ingredients are used. 
They have been tested for richness and purity and carefully weighed and measured with laboratory precision for uniformity. Here we see the ice cream being fed through stainless steel tubes directly into the large five gallon containers which are supplied to soap to fill the orders for sodas, sundaes, cones and the meadow gold special of the month which is always something new and tempting. And here we see row after row and gallon after gallon of meadow gold ice cream being hardened in the 20 below zero temperature of the hardening room. And the Harwoods see other quantities of ice cream being packed especially for use in the home. This really marvelous packaging machine turns out only the tray pack carton. These tray packs fit right into the freezing compartment of the home refrigerator, making it easy and convenient to serve meadow gold ice cream on short notice. And here's something interesting. Ever wonder how they get the stick smack in the middle of the ice cream bar? Well, they first fill the molds with semi-frozen ice cream. Then the sticks are inserted. When hardened, the bars are removed from the mold and placed in chilling chambers. And when frozen hard, they are removed from the chilling chamber. And here you see them getting a bath of rich, sweet chocolate. And they're on their way, each ice cream bar with a smooth coating of the rich chocolate. A special machine quickly inserts the ice cream bars into their protective envelopes at the rate of 100 bars per minute. And they are quickly packed for their journey by refrigerated trucks to points of sale. And while mom goes up to talk with the plant manager, Art is keeping himself well occupied. Take your time, mom. It looks like Art's got a full program laid out for himself. We saw so many flavors of ice cream being made. The children in a whirl. <laughs> I don't know whether I'll be able to drag them away. <laughs> children aren't the only ones who are fond of ice cream. We work hard to keep up with the demand. Ice cream accounts for a good share of our business, about, uh, about 20 percent, I believe. Well, I'll jot that down in my notebook. And that gives us a complete picture of the sources of the incoming dollar. Fluid milk and cream, 26 percent. Butter, 25 percent. Ice cream, 20 percent. Specialty foods and services, 14%. Poultry and eggs, 8%. And other manufactured dairy products, 7%. Total, 100%. You seem to have that notebook pretty well filled, Mrs. Harwood. Oh, yes. We've seen how milk is processed, how butter and ice cream and chalks and vegemato are made. We've met the people who do the planning and the ones who carry out the plans. And I'm beginning to get a real idea of the size and extent of the food industry, Mr. Wells. It must take a great deal of capital to run a business like this. It's true our stockholders supply the initial capital. When you come right down to it, though, it's the customer's dollar that keeps us going and permits us to progress. Let me show you how we spend that dollar, Mrs. Harwood. Uh, oh, yes, here it is. We have a chart made up of figures based on our annual audited report, representing one of the most profitable years in our history. It shows how every penny of the customer's dollar is spent. Oh, that looks interesting. This represents the dollar that must buy all materials and ingredients, pay all salaries and wages, repair and replace equipment, and take care of the many expenses necessary in the conduct of the business. Well, from the way this is divided, it looks like someone gets the lion's share. Well, the lion's share, of course, goes for our basic materials and takes about 68 cents of the incoming dollar. Uh, jot these figures down as we go along. They provide pretty interesting facts for your paper. That's uh, 68 cents for basic materials? That's right. Over 68 cents of every incoming dollar goes to buy milk and cream from the farmer, to purchase sugar, fruits, flavorings. In fact, any ingredient that we need for the processing or manufacture of medical products. Now let's add to that about four cents of every dollar for packaging. That is, the bottles for milk and cream, the cartons for butter and ice cream, and 
cans, and all containers necessary to deliver goods in a sanitary and convenient manner. Now just for the basic materials and the packages to deliver them in, we must spend 72 cents out of every incoming dollar. But that only leaves uh, 28 cents. That's right. What's left must cover all our expenses. Equipment, wear and tear on machinery and buildings, wages and salaries, taxes, everything. And, of course, we must have some profit left over in order to continue to operate successfully. Oh, of course. You remember, Mrs. Harwood, that everywhere you went, you met well-trained medical employees. You saw office workers taking care of the daily routine necessary to keep accurate records and accounts and to transact business. You saw men especially trained to run the machinery in the plants. You met ice cream salesmen, grocery product salesmen, who were proud to wear the Metagold insignia. Your own rock men at home is carefully trained, as are thousands of others, to sell Metagold products and give good, reliable service. Yes, that's certainly true. Well, the wages and salaries of all these employees represent almost half of what's left after we have purchased our basic materials and packages. They receive the next largest cut, or over 13 cents of the incoming dollar. Now what's left of our dollar, Mrs. Harwood? There's a balance of just 15 cents. That's right. And what's left must cover many expenses. You remember, Mrs. Harwood, you saw the raw milk being brought into the plant. Oh, yes. First, that milk must be tested for richness and purity. Now, that means the expense of special laboratory equipment capable men to handle that equipment. Next, it was placed in the holding tank, where machinery and refrigeration mean an additional cost. And then, milk and cream must be pasteurized. Pasteurizing machinery and all processing machinery must be kept in top-notch condition. So, for the maintenance, repair, and replacement of all equipment, and for the steam and refrigeration required in different steps of processing, we spend a little under four cents of the incoming dollar. Uh, now what have we left? That leaves about 11 cents. That's right. Now three cents of that goes to provide trucks and pay the operating expenses, such as gas and tires and so forth. Included in this same amount of three cents is the cost of our advertising. That covers all the colorful, attractive store advertising you see. Advertising in national magazines, billboards, and every means necessary to acquaint people with our products. In order to progress, every food company must advertise, not only to acquaint present customers with new products, but to get new customers for established products. Now, that same three cents also covers equipment and supplies necessary to give prompt and efficient delivery service to our customers. I understand there's no delivery service in the world as efficient and economically run as dairy delivery service. Yes, our delivery service is something we can be proud of. And now, how much is left of the dollar? I hope you don't have many more items to come out of this. There's only nine cents left. Mm -hmm. And two cents of the nine goes for such items as overhead. That is, for rent for buildings where we do business. Also, the telephone and telegraph service necessary to expedite business promptly. It covers interest paid and insurance on properties. And, as you may know, Life insurance is made available to our employees on a basis that they couldn't hope to duplicate individually. Only a short period of service is necessary in order to be eligible. And the amount of insurance obtainable increases with the length of service. And here's another recognition of service that I'm pretty proud to wear. It means 20 years with Metagold. Of course, many others have a much longer record of service. It must be a good place to work if so many employees have such fine records. The food industry is a very dependable one. It suffers least in times of decline, for the simple reason that we all have to eat to live. It offers a steady future and real stability. But to get back to our dollar, or what's left of it. There's only six cents left. Mm-hmm. And of that six cents, about three cents goes for taxes, of which there are many. Federal taxes, state taxes, real estate taxes, city licenses, and many others. I hope you don't have many more items of expense. There's only about four cents left. We're down to our smallest item of expense. One-fifth of a cent of the incoming dollar goes for officers and director salaries. A very small amount, since these are the men who plan, supervise, and take the responsibility for guiding the business. Well, I've heard my husband say 
that 95% of the businesses fall by the wayside in a few years. So to endure for over 50 years like Meadowgold has, there certainly must have been good leadership throughout that long period. I guess the proper management in business is the deciding factor between success and failure. Yes, good management is certainly essential. And any business that is to endure must provide against the lean years too. Which brings us back to what's left of the customer's dollar. We have left about three cents. Our stockholders receive a little over one cent of this amount. The remainder, or about two cents, is reinvested in the business to buy new equipment, to rebuild plants, and so on. I'm amazed at how closely everything is figured. I'm glad I don't have to account for my household money down to the last penny. I'm inclined to take my profits out first. Well, you can't do that in business. Not if you want to stay in business. And Metagold is pretty proud of its 50 years. But it's looking forward to the next 50 years, too. And from everything I've seen and heard in Meadow Gold plants all over the country, you have every good reason to be proud. Goodbye, Mr. Wells, and thank you very much. Goodbye, Mrs. Harwood. And if you're ever down this way again, be sure to stop in and see us. I'd love to. Thank you. And in appreciation of the courtesies extended her by the Meadow Gold organization, Mrs. Harwood, true to her word, visited Mr. Haskell and told him of the very interesting experiences she had visiting the Meadow Gold plants. I hadn't realized before how many people are working to meet the food requirements of America and how much carefulness and cleanliness and detail goes into it. Yes, we spare no time or effort in rendering service and fine products. In return, we receive the customer's dollar with which to continue our business. And then Mr. Haskell asked me if any of the plant managers had shown me how the sales dollar is divided. I told him that they had and that I'd found it very interesting. And it meant a great deal more to me after having seen just how much work and expense are involved in getting dairy products to our homes every day. Mr. Haskell summed it up in a few words. He said that the dairy industry is the largest industry in the world. Millions of people depend upon it and the industry in turn depends upon the people it serves. And when our trip was over, I truly felt I'd spent one of the most pleasant and worthwhile summers. I'd learned a great deal that I didn't know before. And I think I'm better able now to appreciate the tremendous job that people in the food industry are doing. Thanks, Mrs. Harwood, for sharing your trip with us. You made us feel as though we were all right along with you. And I think we all realize now that supplying food for 150 million people 365 days a year is certainly a big job. And while Mrs. Harwood was talking, I jotted down a few notes of my own. Imagine 40 million housewives going to the store each day for groceries. Think of the millions of farmers working to produce the food. Then add to that millions of people in transportation who operate the railroads and the trucks. Then the many hundreds of thousands working in the food plant. Also, there must be thousands of grocery stores ready to service. That really gives us some idea of the tremendous scope of the food industry. That's absolutely right, Mrs. Thompson. And here's how Beatrice Foods Company is fulfilling its share of the task. In one year, it produces enough butter to spread 3,500,000,000 slices of bread. Enough milk for 1,040,000,000 generous glasses. Enough ice cream for more than 850 million delicious servings. With these and many other wholesome, healthful foods, Beatrice is doing its part to render a service to the American people in helping to provide life's greatest necessity, food.